Jungle Jungle Tales of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs Chapter Two <coughs> The Capture of Tarzan The Black Warriors laboured the humid heat of the jungles, stifling shade, the war spears, they loosened the thick black loom, the dope layers of rotting vegetation, heavy nailed fingers they scooped away disintegrated earth from the scent of the age-old grain trail. Often they ceased their labours to squat, resting, gossiping, with laughter at the edge of the pit they were digging. Against the boilows of nearby trees leaned their long oval shields of thick buffalo hide, the peers of those who were doing the scooping, sweat glistened upon their smooth, Abion skins beneath which rolled and rounded muscles, supple in the perfection of nature's uncontaminated health. Reed Bluck, stepping wearily along the trail, towards water halted at a burst of laughter, broke upon his startled ears. For the moment he stood statuex, he sent to his diluting nostrils. Then he wheeled and fled noiselessly by the terrifying presence of man. Hundred yards away, deep in the tangle of the impenetrable jungle, Numa the lion raised his massive head. Numa dined well till almost daybreak. It required much noise to waken him. Now he lifted his nozzle and sniffed the air, caught the arid scent spore of the red reed buck, the heavy scent of man. But Numa was well filled. With a low, disgusted grunt, he rose and slunk away. Grimly plump. Plumaged birds for righteous voices darted from tree to tree. Little monkeys chattering and scolding swung through the swaying limbs above the black warriors. Yet they were alone. Jingling jungles is married life. Like the swarming streets of great metropolis is one of the lonely spots in God's great universe. But were they alone? Above them, lightly balanced upon a leafy tree, Liam a grey-eyed youth Watch with eager intentness their every move. They had a fire of hate, restrained, smouldered, smouldered beneath the lad's evident desire to know the purpose of black men's labours. Such a one of these it was who had slain his beloved Kayla. For them there could be naught but an end to me, yet he liked well to watch them and vid as he was of greater knowledge of the ways of man. He saw the pit grow in depth until a great hole yawned, the width of the trail, a hole which was ample, large enough, hold at one time all six excavators. Tarzan could not guess the purpose of so great a labour. They cut long stakes, sharpened their upper hands, and set up, sharpened their upper ends, and set them intervals up right at the bottom of the pit. He wondered, but increased. Nor was it satisfied with placing light cross poles at the pit, the careful arrangement of leaves and earth which completely hid from view the work the black men had performed. When he had done, they surveyed their handiwork with evident satisfaction. Tarzan surveyed it too. Even his his eye, there remained scarce a vigilance of evidence. Ancient grain trail had been tampered with in any way. So above all was the eight men's spectation. Speculation as the purpose of the covered pit. He invented blacks to part the direction of their village without the usual baiting, which had rendered him a terror Mogabola's people, and have afforded Tarzan such a vehicle of revenge and source inexhaustible delight. Puzzle as he would, however, he could not dissolve the mystery of the concealed pit, for the ways of blacks were still strange ways to Tarzan. He had entered his jungle but a short time before. First of their kind who crouch upon their old age old supremacy beasts which laid there to nimble the lion, to tentor the elephant, the great apes and lesser apes to each all the myriad creatures of this savage world, the ways of man were new. They had much to learn these black hairless creatures. They walk erect, their hand put their hind put upon their hind paws. They were learning it slowly and always to their sorrow. So the other blacks had departed, Tarzan swung easily to the trail. Sniffing suspiciously, he circled the edge of the pit, 
squatting upon his haunches, he scraped away a little earth to his bones. When the took crossbars, he sniffed as he touched it, cocked his head upon one side and contemplated it grave, gravely for several minutes. Then he carefully moved, covered it, ranging earth as neatly as did the blacks. This done, he swung himself back over among the branches, the trees, and moved off in search. Terry fellows, great apes of tribe, can cack. Once he crossed the trail of Numa the lion, pausing for a moment, his tail was swell fruit, suddenly faced his enemy, and tautly insult him, calling him into the curium and brother Dago, the hyena. Numa, his yellow eye, green eyes, round and burning with concentrated hate, glared a dancing figure above him. Low growls vibrated the high heavy jowls. The great rage terminated into sumptuous trimless tail, a sharp with full motion. But realising the past spirits of fertility, long distant argument the ape man, he turned presently, struck her off at into tangled vegetation, hidden from the view of his tormentor. The fun scream of jungle in invective ape like grimace with his departing foe, Tarzan continued among his way on his way. Another mile and shifting wind brought to his keen nostrils a familiar pungent odour close at hand. A moment later, there loomed beneath him a huge grey-black bulk foraging steadily among the grumble tail. Tails as he broke a small tree limb, a sudden crackling sound, a ponderous figure halted, grey ears were thrown forward. A long, supple trunk rose quickly the way you to and fro in search of the scent of an enemy. While well, two weak little eyes pierced superstitiously, suspiciously of fertility, fertility, about a quest of the alpha, the noise which disturbed his peace away. Tarzan laughed and loud, came close above the head, a perisidium. Tento, Tento, he cried. Bara the deer is less fearful than you. Tento the elephant, greatest of the jungle folk, the strength as many numbers, say his toes upon my feet, and fingers upon my hands, Tento. Who can uproot great trees trembles with fear the sound of a rogue and twig. An unbeing noise of might have been either sign of contentment or sign of relief was turned towards the only reply. Outlifted trunk and ears came down, the beast tail dropped to normal, but his eyes still rolled, rolled about in search of Tarzan. He was too long. He was not too long, kept in suspense, however, as to the whereabouts of the ape man. For a second later, the youth dropped lightly to the broad head of his own friend, and stretching himself to the full length, he drummed with his bare toes upon the fair kind. His fingers scratched the more tender surface beneath the great ears. He took the tender of the gossip of the jungle, as though the great beast understood every word that he said. Much there was which Tarzan could make tender understand. Although the small talk of the wild beyond the great grey dreadnought of the jungle, he stood with blinking eyes, a swaying, gently swaying trunk, a low drinking in every word of it, with a keenest apprehension. As a matter of fact, it was with pleasant, friendly voice and caressing hands between his ears that he just enjoyed the close proximity of him, whom he had often borne upon his back since Tarzan as a little child, and once fiercely approached the great bull. Assuming upon a part, but tarried him, his same friendness which filled his own heart. Years of association, Tarzan discovered he possessed an inexplainable power to govern, dread his mighty friend, his bidding. Tentor would come from a great distance, as far as his keen eyes could detect the shrill, piercing summons of the ape man. Then, and when Tarzan was squatted upon his head, Tender would lumber through the jungle in a direction which is ready to bad him go with the power of man mind over that of brute. It was just as effective as both, though both for his standard its origin, though neither did. For half an hour Tarzan sprawled there upon Tantor's back. Time had no meaning for them, for either of them. Life, as they saw it, constituted principally, keeping his stomach full filled. To Tarzan it was less arduous labour than to Tentor. Their first started his stomach, Tarzan's stomach smaller, and being onimous, food was less difficult to obtain. One did not come, one salt that did not come readily to hand, and with all his many others to satisfy his hunger. He was there particular to his diet and Tentor. 
would only eat the bark of certain trees, but others, while a third appealed to him, only through its leaves, leaves perhaps just at certain seasons of the year. Tenter must needs spend the whole night of the time in his life with filling his immense stomach against the knees of his mighty throes. It is thus with all the lower elders. Their lives so occupied either with such in food or with the possessiveness of digestion. They had little time for their other considerations. Doubtless is a handicap which kept them from advancing as rapidly as man. There was no time to give to thought upon other matters. However, these questions troubled Tarzan, but little, turned to not at all. But the former knew was that he was happy in the companionship of the elephant. He did not know why. He did not know that because he was a human being, a healthy human being, he craved more living thing upon which to lavish his affection. Craved some living thing upon which to lavish affection. Child of playmates among the apes of Kamak were great sullen brutes. They felt no spied but little affection. A younger ape Tarzan still played with occasionally in a savage way he loved them, but they were far from satisfying real restful companions, turned over the great mountain of calm, poise of stability, with restful and satisfying to sprawl upon his rough pit, pour one's vague hopes and aspirations to one of the great ears that flap promiscuously to a throne of apparent understanding. With all the jungle folk, Tentador commanded Tarzan's greatest love, said Kala had been taken from him. Sometimes Tarzan wondered if Tentor really approached his affection. It was difficult to know. The call of the stomach, the most compelling and insistent call which the jungle knows, that took Tarzan finally back to the trees of his search of food, while Tentor continued his interrupted journey the opposite direction. But there are the eight men foraged. A lofty nest yielded of rich, warm, fresh, warm harvest, fruits, berries, tender plantain. Found a place for his, upon his menu in the order he happened upon them, for he did not seek not seek such foods. Meat, meat, meat. It was always meat that Tarzan and the apes hunted, but sometimes meat eluded him as a day. Thrown for the jungle, his active mind busied itself not alone with his hunting, but many other subjects. He had a habit of recalling after the events of the preceding days and hours. He lived all over his visit with Tentor, who he contracted upon the digging backs and strange covered pit they left behind them. He wondered again and again what its purpose would it be, created perceptions, and arrived at judgments. He compared judgments, reaching conclusions, but not always correct ones. It's true. At least he used his brain for the purpose God intended it. Which was less difficult because he's not handicapped by his second hand, and usually an er- erroneous judgment of others. As he hovers over the cover fit, there would loom suddenly before his mental vision a huge grey black bulk. He lumbered ponderously along a jungle trail. Instantly, Tarzan's intense shock of sudden fear. He is in action, usually occupied simultaneously the life of eight men. Now he's always. He was away through leafy branches. Realization of pit purpose of swaying scarce formed its mind. My fame being for the swaying limb the swaying limb, he raced for the middle terraces, where the trees grew closer together. Again he dropped to the ground and spread silently in flight of foot. Over the carpet decaying vegetation, only to leap again to trees where tangled engrowth precluded rapid advance upon the surface. His anxieties cast direction to the winds, caution the beast as lost in the loyalty of the man. It become so it came that he entered a large clearing and looped deluded denuded noted of trees, about of fault that they might lie there upon the further edge of spooked away with him. His half way across went directly in his path, and but in a few yards away there rose from a clump of tall grasses half a dozen chattering birds. Instantly Tarzan turned on one side, for he knew well enough that matter a creature presence where the little sentinels proclaimed simultaneously. Bruta the rhinoceros scrambled to his short legs and changed furiously furiously 
have heard the charges Bruto one of the sisters three guys he didn't he sees but poorly even at short distances whether his erratic rushes due to panic of fear his attempts to escape or his scrapable to temper which he is generally credited is difficult to determine nor is a matter of little moment to one whom Bruto charges for he is caught and tossed the chances are naught will interest him thereafter and today it chanced that Broto bore down straight upon Tarzan, across a few yards of deep, deep grass which separated them. Accident seen dotted him, direction eight man. Then his weak eyes discerned the enemy. With serious snorts he charged straight for him. The little line of birds fluttered and circled round the great ward. Among the tree bunches of trees at edge of the clearing, a score of more monkeys chattered and scolded the loud snorts of angry beasts. Sent them scurrying friendly to the other crevices. Tarzan alone appeared indifferent and serene. Directly in the path of the charge he stood. There be no time to seek safety in the trees for the clearing, nor that Tarzan had any mind to lay his journey because of Bruto. But he had met the stupid beast before and held him with fine contempt. Now Bruto was upon him in massive lead, lowered with long, heavy horn inclined. The frightful work with which nature designed it. As he struck upward, his weapon raked only thin air. Eight men sprang lightly aloft, a cat like leap, and covered him, carried him above the threatening horn, the broad back of the rhinoceros. Marvel spring, he was on the ground, by the brute, and racing like a deer to the trees. Both are angered and mystified by strange disappearance of prey. We were in charge friendly, no direction which chanced to be not the direction. A thousand flight, so the eight men came in safely to the trees, can you swift way with the forest. So this is a head to him. Tentor moved steady along the well torn pup elephant pale. Head of Tentor, crouching black warrior, listened intently, in the middle of the path. Presently he heard a sound of which he had been hoping. Crackling, sapling sound, heralded approach of the elephant. In his right and left, others part of the jungle where other warriors were watching. A low signal passed from one another, surprised, surprised the most distant. The quarry was afoot. Rapidly they overcoverged toward the trail, making positions and trees downwind, the point at which Tendor must pass them. Suddenly he waited and presently, avoided by the sight of the mighty tusker, carrying an amount of ivory, his long tusks set their greedy hearts of palpitating. No sooner he passed their positions than the warriors clambered from their perches. No longer were they silent, but instead clamped their hands and shouted. They reached the ground for an instant and tore their front paws, outraised trunk and tail, his short great ears picked, and he sprang on along the trail to rapid, shifting pace straight toward the covered pit. His sharpened stakes out standing ground. Behind him came the whirling whelp, yelping warriors. The early warriors are surging him to go rapid flight, which would not permit the kill of examination of the ground before him. Turn the elephant would have turned and scattered his adversaries. A single charge fled like a frightened deer, fled towards a hideous, torturing death. Behind them all came Tarzan the apes, racing through the forest, jungle forest with a speed and agility squirrel, for he heard the shouts of the warriors interpreted them correctly. Once he uttered a great piercing call of very baby from the jungle, but until in panic of terror, neither failed to hear or hearing deemed not pause to hear deem not pause to heed. The great Perdonium was but a few yards from the hidden death lurking in his path. Black sudden of success was screaming and dancing in wake, waving their war spears and celebrating the advance of Gregorian, the defending army carried by the prey and Sir Sir Frelt of elephant meat, which would be theirs that night. This night, so intent upon their congratulations, congratulations, they entirely failed to note the sudden passage. Man base above their heads, nor did Tentor either see him or hear him. Even now, Tarzan called for him to stop. A few more steps would participate Tentor to sharpen his takes. Tarzan fairly knew for the trees until he had come abreast of the fleeing animal that then passed him. A great verge of eight men dropped the ground in the centre of the trail. Ten was almost upon him, for his weak eyes permitted 
seemed to recognize his old friend stop said cried Tarzan. the great beast halted to outrise his hand Tarzan turned to kick the sides of the brush we see the pit and see ten miles saw and understood fight cried Tarzan. they're coming behind you the tent on the elephant huge bunch of nerves and now he was half panic stricken by terror for him you before he yawned the pit how far he did not know but to the right the lane left of the primeval jungle, touched by man, the squeal of the great beast turned suddenly at right angles and burst his way noisily through the woods of wall of matted vegetation where it stopped any but him. Tarzan standing by the edge of the pit smiled as he watched tender his energy flight. Soon the blacks came would come, best the tars and apes faded from the scene. He had set a step from the pit's edge. He threw the weight of his body upon his left foot and the earth crumbled away. Tarzan made a single holding effort to throw himself forward. He turned late backward and downward he went towards the sharpened stakes at the bottom of the pit. And a moment later the blacks came. They saw even from a distance that Tembo eluded them for the size of the hole of the pit. Karin was too small to have accommodated the huge bulk of an elephant. First they thought their prey had got had but one foot through the top and then warned, drew back. But when they come to pit's verge and peered over, the way went wide in astonishment, while quiet and still, but in my awakened figure of white giant. Some of them were glimpses glimpse of his forest guard, for they drew back in terror, awed presence with it for some time, believed to possess the miraculous powers of demons. But others of those pushed forward, taking thinking only the capture of an enemy, had leaped as those leapt into the, field of the pit and lifted Tarzan out in a scar upon his body. None of the shoving stakes had pierced him, and he swallowed a spot at the base of his brain, could nature his injury. Falling backward, his head struck upon the side, and the stakes were him unconscious. Backs were quick to discover this, and equally quick to blind their spreaders' arms, legs before he should regain consciousness. But he had learned to harbour with a wholesome respect for this strange man beast, consorted with their hairy tree folk. Then they carried him out a short distance towards the village, where the man's eyelids quivered and raised. He looked about at him, wondering for a moment. His full consciousness returned. He realised the seriousness of his predicament. Custom, almost from birth, to relying solely upon his own resources, he did not cast about, out, about for outside and aid now. But devoted his mind to consideration of possibilities of escape, we lay within himself in his own powers. He did not dare test the strength of his bonds. The blacks were carrying him for fear they would become representative and add to them. But he kept discovered his conscience that he had little stomach for carrying heavy men through the jungle heat. They set him upon his feet and forced him forward, among them prickling him now and then with their spears, yet with every manifestation of superstitious awe in which they held him. Then they discovered their prodding brought out no outward evidence of suffering. Their awe increased. They soon desisted, half believing, believing that this strange white giant was a supernatural being, so immune from pain. They approached their village. They shouted, among warriors, vicious cries, several warriors. So by the time they reached the gate, dancing and waving their spears, a great crowd of men, women, children gathered. They had to greet them and hear the story of their adventure. As the eyes of villagers fell upon the prisoner, they went wild and heavy jaws fell open, in astonishment and incredibility. For months they lived in perpetual terror, the weird white demon whom but few had ever glimpsed and lived to describe warriors disappeared from the paths almost out of sight of the village. We in sight of the village from the midst of the companions, spiritually completely as though they had been swallowed by the earth. And later at night their dead bodies had fallen as from the cabins of the village street. The fearful creature appeared by night. The huts of the village killed and disappeared, leaving him, leaving behind him the huts with his dead, strange, terrifying evidences, evidences of a cunning sense of humour. Now he is in their power. No longer could he terrorise him. Slowly realisation is dawned upon them. A woman, screaming, ran forward, struck the ape man across the face. Another, another followed her example. To a thousand each was surrounded by fighting, clawing, yelling mobs of natives. Then Babogo, the chief, came and laying his spear, having across the shoulders of his people, drove them from their prey. 
He was we were saving him until night, he said. Far out in the jungle, Tamdo the elephant, first panic of fear, eluded. Stood with up packed ears and a routine trunk. While he was passing through the convulsion motions of his savage brain, could he be searching for Tarzan? Could we recall and measure the surface of eight men falling for him? Oh, there'd be no doubt. But he did not did he, but did he feel gratitude? Would he have risked his own life to save Tarzan? Could he have known the danger which confronted his friend? You would doubt it. Anyone at all familiar with elephants would doubt it. Even myself, men who hunted much within with elephants in India, will we'll, we'll tell you and never have heard an instance in which one of these animals has gone to aid a man in danger. Even a man had often befriended it. So it would be doubted that Tendor, Tendor would have attempted to overcome his instinct fear of the black man in an effort to succor Tarzan. The screams of ferrated villagers came faintly, sent his ears. He reeled as a flow in terror, contemplated flight, but something stayed him again. He turned again, raised his trunk, and gave a voice a shrill call. He then stood listening. In the distant village there, Mount Bola, there was stored quite an order. The voice of Tendor was scarcely audible to Black, but to the keen eyes of Tars and the apes, by his message. Captors were leading him to hut. We might be confined and guarded against the coming of the nocturnal orgy. Said the remark, he's tortured, lame death. He halted as he heard the notes of Tendor's call. Raising his head, gave vent to a terrifying scream, sent cold chills for the suspicious blacks, calls the warriors who guarded him. Deep even deep back, even though their prisoner's arms were securely bound behind him. They have raised spears, they circled him for a moment longer. He stood listening. Fading from a distance came another answering cry. Tarzan ate sat away, turned, quite pursued his way towards the hut where he was to be imprisoned. The afternoon wore on. For the only village, eight men heard the bustle and preparation for the feast. For the doorway of the hut, he saw the women laying the cooking fires. With the earth and cauldrons, the water. Above all this, the event across the jungle, eager listening for the coming of Tentor. Even Tarzan was but half believed he would come, but he knew Tentor was be- even better than Tentor knew himself. He knew the timid heart which lay in a great body, in a giant body. He knew the panic of terror which had sent of Gomori, which inspired within the savage beast. The night drew up on. Hope died within his heart. In a stoic calm to wild beasts, he was. He was only himself to meet his fate, which awaited him. All afternoon he had been working, working, working the bonds of help with his wrists. Very slowly he was giving. He might flee his hands before they came to lead him to butchered, to be butchered. But he did toss and licked his lips in amputation. Smiled a cold, grim smile. He could imagine the feel of soft flesh beneath his fingers, seeing his white teeth in the throats of his former. He would let them taste his rough, but they overpowered him. At last they came painted, befeathered warriors, even more hideous than nature had been tending them. They came and pushed him to the open, with his parents as greeted by wild shouts from the assembled villages. The state they led him, as they pushed him roughly against his primary tree, to binding him with their securely, the dance of death will presently circle him. Tides and tense his mighty throes, with strangled, powerful wrench, parted the lo- loosened thongs which had secured his hands. Like fault for quickness, he leaped forward among the warriors nearest him, a blow sent him to earth, as growling and snarling the babes man leaped upon the beast of another. His fangs were buried instantly, the juggler of his avestry. Then a half hundred black men had leaped upon him, and bore down to, uh, him to earth, striking, clawing, Snapping as eight men fought, fought to his foster people. They taught him to fight, fight like a wild beast cornered. His strength, his agility, his courage, his intelligence rendered him easily a match for half a dozen black men to in hand to hand struggle. But not even Tarzan Apes could hope to successfully cope with half a hundred. Slowly they were overpowering him. Though a score of them bled with ugly wounds, two lay still beneath the trampling feet, their rolling bodies. The consistence. Overpowering their might, 
but could they keep him under the power where they bound him? A half an hour desperate endeavour convinced them they could not. So Mo, Maboga, who was like all good rulers, is circled in the safety of the background, called to one of the called to one work his way in and speared a victim. Gradually, through the milling, bloody men, the warrior approached the object's quest. He stood with poison poison spear by his head, waiting for instance Disposed of one or part of eight men's body, and still not endangered one of the blacks. Close and close to the edge, without following the movements of twisting, scuffling competence, the growls of eight men sent cold chills in the warrior's spine, causing him to go carefully, lest he miss first cast and lay himself open to attack from his mercy teeth and mighty hands. At last he found an opening. High he raised his spear. But his spear tense his muscles, rolling beneath his glistening ebon hide. And from the jungle just beyond the palace side came thunderous crashing. Her spear hand pulls the black cast, quick glance in the direction of disturbance. And did the others, the blacks, were not occupied, who had not occupied the subjection of the eight men. In the glare of the fires, they stood a huge bulk boat. Tubbing the barricade, they saw the perdurable belly and sway inward. They saw it burst through, built of straws, an instant later, a temple. An elephant thundered back down upon them. To the right and left, the ducks fled, screaming terror. Some of them hovered both upon the verge of strife. With the tars and herd, I made good of escape, but half a dozen of them were so wrapped in their bloody madness, that they tried, failed to note approach the great tusker. Upon these timber charged, trumpeting furiously. Above them he stopped, he sent his trunk waving among them. There at the bottom he found Tarzan bloody, but still battling. Whoever turned his eyes upward from the mini. Above him towered a gigantic bulk of the Peridonium. Little eyes flashing with a reflected light, fires wicked, frightful, terrifying. The warriors screamed, and as he screamed, the thunderous trunk. And ground circled him, lifted him high above the ground, and hurled him far above after a fleeing crowd. Another, another, Tambor wrenched from the body of the eight men, throwing him right to left. They lay either moaning or very quiet. The death came slowly all at once. A distant Mobo, Moboga read his troops, he read the eyes, and noted the great ivory task of the bull. The greatest panic of terror relieved. He urged the men forward to attack. The heavy elephant spears, but as they came, Tembo swung Tarzan to his broad head, and willing lumbered off in the jungle for the great rent he had made in the palisade. If hunters may be right, may ever, 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 that this animal would not have rendered such a service to a man, but the tame door, Tarzan was not a man, he was but a fellow jungle beast. It is so that Temple the Elephant discharged the obligation to Tarzan the Apes, cementing even more closely the friendship that had existed between them. The Tarzan and the little brown boy rode upon Tendo's huge back through the moonlit jungle beneath the equatorial stars. <laughs>